Rock Sonic. Hey everyone, just taking a quick 15 seconds to let you know that my new book, The Fitness Mindset, Eat for Energy, Train for Attention, Manage Your Mindset, and Reap the Results, which hit the bestseller list within 24 hours of its release, is now available to buy on Amazon. So if you're looking for everything you need to get into incredible shape and the mindset to keep it forever, be sure to check it out. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Welcome to Brian Keen Fitness Podcast, where we talk everything fitness, nutrition, and mindset with your host, Brian Keane. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Brian Keane Fitness Podcast. We talk everything fitness, nutrition, and mindset to help you with your goals. Today's episode is a Q&A and I've pulled these questions from my Instagram and my Snapchat which are probably my two most active platforms at the minute. I'm spending a lot of time on both. Um, my Instagram is Brian Keen Fitness. My Snapchat's Brian K019. I'm actually spending an ungodly amount of time on Instagram at the minute, um, just trying to reply to people's DMs. I, I can try and get back to as many as I can, um, and I'm, I'm loving Instagram at the minute, and I'm still really active on Snapchat, trying to do Q and A's nearly most days during the week on there. Um, so the first question comes in from Instagram today. And that's from Dun11. Uh, I'm on a strict diet. How can I stop cravings at nighttime? Um, okay, so the first thing to know with cravings at nighttime is normally a sign that there may be something off in your nutrition or in your diet during the day if you're constantly getting nighttime cravings from a physiological response. If you're getting just an emotional or a mental craving, that's very, very different to actually physically or physiologically feeling like you need to have something sugary or need to have junk food. So it's very important to understand the difference between both because if you have a mental habit of having some chocolate before bedtime or in the evening, you're gonna to have to knock out that. There's a great book by Charles Dewey called The Power of Habit. I quoted it in my book, The Fitness Mindset, and he talks about the cue, trigger, reward of habits. Um, and if you find that your nutrition is very, very good during the day, you're getting all your vitamins, you're getting all your minerals, you're not too low on calories, but you're still getting like an habitual craving, so you're sitting down at the same chair, the same table, the same time of night, the same TV shows in the background, and you're getting a craving for chocolate um, or whatever your food of choice is and that may be just a habitual habit that you've created so that's going to be very much de breaking that down um, and deconstructing a new way so that you're able to actually put a new habit in place um, so if it's that what I would advise you doing is try to come up with a new habit in the evening so sometimes something as simple as sitting in a new chair or having a hot drink instead of your chocolate bar can start to break that habit the university of london said that it takes 66 days to form a new habit so you have to do that process over the space of about two months just to kind of form a completely new habit however if you are physiologically craving some foods late at night and you said yourself you're on a strict diet there may be something during the day that you're eating or under eating in terms of overall calories that's leaving you with a bad craving at night time and um, one of the things that i try and do with people that come through my programs particularly my top 50 program is you're spacing your meals out so you're keeping your blood sugar levels stable so you're not going to get any craving from a blood sugar angle what can happen is if you go too long during the day without eating you can get your blood sugars can start to drop off and then you need to eat something sugary to spike them up and then they drop off again half an hour 40 minutes later and then that cycle continues for the entire day so not only are you having your energy going up and down and it's hard to stay focused on anything you're also going to end up eating worse food because you craving that sugar hit um, so that's one thing to look at I do that with people in my GA lean body program as well more so to keep the energy levels optimal so the performance is, is going to be at its maximum on the pitch and in the gym but it's very important to make sure that you have that in place as well Another thing to look at is certain foods that you're eating during the day may be causing more cravings later on at night. For example, I know when I eat protein bars or when I used to eat protein bars and any form of polyalcohols, um, and chewing gum was the same, anything that mimicked insulin in the brain, um, which effectively tells your brain you're going to get something sugary, so that sweetness sends a message to your brain to say you're going to get some sugar and your pancreas releases insulin and it sends this negative feedback loop so that what happens is you don't get any elevation in sugar and it sends your cravings crazy later on in the day. Um, some people don't get this, some people get it minorly and some people get it majorly. I'm one of those people that gets it majorly. If I have a protein bar at lunchtime or I 
I have chewing gum or something like that, I know I'm craving something really, really sweet later on in the day because of it. Um, so that is worth looking into as well, that there's not something in your nutrition that's triggering off your cravings, your diet drinks, your protein bars, your chewing gum. Some people aren't affected, but if you're someone that is getting cravings at night time, it's worth looking into that to see if that's what's causing it. The last thing then is to make sure that you're not under eating. So if you're on a strict diet, when people say strict diet, it always kind of sends up a red flag to me because I, I've spoken about it in the podcast before. I mentioned it in my book, The Fitness Mindset. I speak about it on lots of videos and other mediums that I'm on that the best nutritional plan you'll follow is one that fits into your lifestyle, that fits into your schedule, that has foods that you enjoy that's in alignment with your specific goals. When you're following a diet, you come off a diet. Um, one of the things that I try and do in my Top 50 program, one of the things I try and do in my GA Lean Body program, one of the things I try and talk about through the book is making sure that you're merging and making the right food choices so that you're enjoying the process and you're getting in shape as a result. Like the Buddha quote that if you can't be happy on the journey, how are you gonna be happy? If you can't be happy on the journey, how are you gonna be happy at the destination? lends itself very, very well into nutrition. Because if you're on a diet and you're starving yourself, you're not gonna be able to keep that up long term. That's why fad diets and fast diets and, and um, juice diets and these things don't work long term. On top of the negative physiological response on hormones that regulate satiation and regulate hunger, they also don't last because they're diets you're following for six weeks. When you start to make things that are more of a lifestyle change and you educate yourself on certain foods that you enjoy that are in supporting your goals, because healthy food doesn't have to be boring. You can mix, mix around with recipes. I have recipes in my program programs. There's other books out there with fitness recipes. It doesn't have to be boring. It's just educating yourself on what foods are going to support your specific goals and then factoring those in. And when you build it into your lifestyle and it's not a diet you're following, you're setting yourself up for long-term success. As soon as you smack the diet label on something, it's short term. It's six weeks. It's 12 weeks. It's maybe 18 weeks. And then you fall off and then you're back to where you were beforehand. When you change up the way you see your food and you change up the way you see your nutrition and you change up the way you look at diets in general and you start focusing on foods that you enjoy that are supportive to your specific goals that factor in with your macros and your calories and everything that are in alignment with your goals that's how you set yourself up for long-term success so that's something else i would look on in terms of cravings to make sure that you're not under eating too much food just to look good for a wedding or look good for a date or look good for an event over the long term because on top of down regulating ghrelin, leptin, your hunger, your satiation hormones, effectively the hormones that tell your body you're full and hungry, on top of down-regulating these from excessive dieting, you're not gonna be able to keep it up long-term. And then you have the mental backlash of, oh, I was in great shape and now I'm not in great shape. And then you start eating yourself up and then you go back on another diet to try and get back to where you were. And then you have this negative feedback loop of your body being out of whack, your physiology and your hormones being out of whack and your mindset completely attacking you because you're going from one shape to another and then back again. Um, so that's something else I would look on. But in terms of overall cravings at nighttime, check off those three in terms of the foods that you're eating during the day to make sure there's no trigger foods there, your balance and your blood sugars, and then you're making sure that you're not under eating on an excessive calorie restricted diet, um, and then hopefully that'll help your nighttime cravings. Next question comes in from Joe O'Neill Fitness on Instagram. Advice on goal setting. Um, okay, so I have a couple of approaches that I use for goal setting. For me, and I spoke about this in my book in the mindset section, that the key for me and what I've done with a lot of people I've worked with that come through my programs is making sure that you have a strong enough why, that you understand why you're doing things and then creating the daily habits around that so that you make the right automatic choices with your food, with your training, so it's all geared towards the end goal. You can't hit a target you can't see. So if you don't know what the end goal is, it is impossible to hit it. It's like going into your car and not knowing where you wanna go on the destination and you're just driving around like a headless chicken not knowing what the end goal is. If I know I wanna go from Galway or to Dublin or London to Birmingham or San Francisco to New York, it, it pays to understand what the end destination is because then I can put a map in place and I can design a process for how I'm going to get there. If you don't know how you're going to get there, you're never going to get there. I spoke about it in the book that you're better to have the ladder at the bottom against the right wall than to be halfway up the ladder against, in, in, against the wrong wall. 
And in that sense, in the context for me, I was speaking about my teaching career and going into personal training and starting a fitness business that I was halfway up the teaching ladder, but it was against the wrong wall. It wasn't what I wanted to do. It wasn't my calling. It wasn't the thing that got me out of bed every morning, even though I loved it. I loved my kids. I loved the school. I loved the teachers. I loved the parents, but it wasn't my calling. It wasn't the thing that I feel that I was put on this earth to do. Fitness gave me that feeling. So even when I moved back to Ireland three and a half years ago, when I moved back into my mom and dad and was in their spare room and I was on social welfare and I was driving my sister's little Yaris that I didn't know what started every morning, I had the ladder up against the right wall. So even though I had no social media, I had no income, I had no business, I had nothing, I had the ladder against the right wall and I had the dream of what I wanted to achieve. And I'm a high end believer that when you know what the end goal is, your reticular activation system in your brain, it's basically your internal GPS, it tells your brain what to focus on, it's cognitive neuroscience, it'll allow you to see the path and the things that you haven't been able to see up to that point, you're gonna be able to see. Like Buddha said that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And that's what happens. When you make a decision that you want to become a county footballer or you want to be get, be, get slim, slimmer so you have more confidence in a room or you want to leave your job to start a new business or you want to be the best mom and dad and be there for your family forever, you having that in goal allows you to hit that. The practical steps then after is writing it down. Like I've got whiteboards all over my office, all over my room, because it allows me to physically see, and you, I'm a high-end believer that you can think things into existence, assuming that you put in the right work, surround yourself with the right people, and consume the information that supports that end goal. But it all comes with writing it down, and then constantly referring to it. I have a whiteboard in my room, everything that was my 2017 goals, now it's my 2018 goals, because we're moving towards the end side of the year, and every decision I make is based out of, does that support the end goal? Does that support the business goals? Does that support the personal goals? Does that support the relationship goals? If it doesn't, I don't do it. If it does, I'm all in. I spoke in the book, in the mindset section, that I base a lot of my life philosophy on that I'm either all in on something or I'm out. There's no half pregnant. They don't, I don't do binary. I'm, not, I, I, I'm on binary. I'm on or off. I'm in or out. And when you live your life that way and you know what your goals are and you're working towards them and you can visually see them, they're there when you wake up in the morning. They're there when you go to bed. They're at your office. The decisions you make are going to start to feed into your subconscious mind and then every conscious decision you make on the people you hang around with, the books that you read, the YouTube people or the Facebook people or the Instagram people you follow are all going to feed into that end goal when you make a choice. So in terms of setting goals, that's my exact process. Having the strong why and then creating the habits daily around it that supports that goal. So reading the books, following the right people and then writing it down and then basing every decision I make off, is this supporting the goal? If it is, I do it. If it isn't, I don't. Um, And that's my entire process. I do that for year goals. I have that for five-year goals. And I have that for 10-year goals. The key to success, and if you have a pen and pencil, write this shit down right now. The key to success, from my point of view, from my years of working and reading and being around people that are achieving more than me, is knowing what the end goal is and not being attached to how you get there. That's it. That is the key to long-term success and getting whatever it is you want. Knowing the end goal, not being attached to how you get there. I had a conversation with a girl recently and she was like, oh, I'm the opposite. I'm like, I was like, the fucking opposite? I'm like, if you're the opposite and she's like, well, I know how I want to get there, but I don't know where I want to go. I'm like, listen to yourself fucking speak. I'm like, that doesn't even make any sense. I'm like, if you, she was like, well, I want to get there this way, but I don't know where I want to go. You can't hit a target you can't see. And if you're attached to getting there, you're not also not going to be able to move with the times. We are in an age, and we're so fortunate to be in the social media age, to be in the information technology age, where we have everything we need at a click of a finger. We have opportunities, we can reach to people that we would never have been able to get to in the past. We have that opportunity right now. But if you're attached to how you do something, you're, you're not gonna be able to move with the times. You're not gonna be able to pivot. You're not gonna be able to go in the direction. But if you know what the end goal is, and then you start pivoting and reframing failure as 
one other way that didn't work and then you move forward and you find another way that didn't work and you jump that obstacle or you jump that hurdle and you keep moving fucking forward until you get to what you want to get to and you hit your target you hit your goals and that's the key to long-term success so if you have and you're curious that's it from and this is coming from me and again it's an opinion because everything's an opinion and perspective of this moment in time but from the books that i've read from the mentors that i've had from the people i've worked with that's the key to success it's having the end goal in mind and not being attached to how you get there so my advice is write that in goal down in all areas of your life for the ones that are the most important on your value ladder that are most important to you whether that's your body composition whether that's your family whether that's your life whether that's your job whether that's financial whatever the thing is that's most important for you write it down and then be don't be attached to how you get there buddha said and i'm a lot of buddha quotes in this episode Buddha said that suffering comes from the attachment of an idea. And when you're attached to an idea, that's where all your suffering comes from. So when you let go of that, but you hold on to the end goal and you know what you're trying to achieve, you not only are you going to be happier getting there and happier on the journey, but you're also going to open yourself up and open up your mind so you're not getting any cognitive biases or confirmation bias where all you want to see is confirming evidence of what you believe. You're going to start to negate all of that and be able to move forward towards the things that you want, regardless of what your goals are. I am also a big believer in BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals. Uh, Jack Canfield talked about it in his 20 Success Principles books. One of the reasons that I'm training for the Marathon Disables for those of you that don't know, which is a six day self-sufficient um, 256 kilometer run through the Sahara Desert next year. I set that goal because my initial thought process when I heard about it was, fuck, I don't know if I can do that. And I haven't had that feeling in a long time. So that's why I did it. That's why I signed up. I was like, right, fuck. If that was my, int- that was my automatic go-to feeling and I'm a believer in it behind every fear of the person you want to be. I was like, well, the fact that I initially thought I may not be able to do this is a sign that I have to do it. Will Smith talked about in a video on YouTube, um, and I love the Will Smith videos, that at an early age, he started to attack fear. And as I said, behind every fear of the person you want to be, fear in the acronym, false evidence appearing real. So when you step into the things that are you're afraid of and you set your goals so high that if you miss the moon, you at least hit the stars and you set your goals high, you're still gonna be happy and you're still gonna be fulfilled trying to hit that and achieve that. The practical tip then is writing it down and not being attached to the idea on how you get there. Okay, next question comes in from Dara Garrity on Snapchat. How did you stay in shape in college when you drank so much? Um, Okay, so for those of you following my Snapchat, um, I put up a lot more about my personal life on Snapchat so you can kind of get a bit more into my background and where I came from. Um, Basically, to give you a little bit of a background, I was very, very heavy into the party scene. Um, I had a very, very bad alcohol problem for a while. Now, I had an awesome time. Like, I loved my college experience, but I was drinking six, seven nights a week um, consistently for two or three years, which in all intents and pers- purposes, is an alcohol problem. Um, now, I had a wicked time. <laughs> like, it was awesome. But I did realize coming out the other side, a lot of it was down to numbing out from different things that were going on in my life. And just it was my way of disconnecting from the world. Um, I since did it with exercise. And I've since dealt with a lot of those demons that I've spoken about in the book. Um, but in terms of staying in shape, coming through college and drinking so much... The truth is, once you keep your nutrition on point and you keep your diet semi-clean, you're still training, alcohol, even though your body will not build muscle and it will not lose body fat efficiently or effectively while there's alcohol in your system, you can still burn through it as an energy source and as long as your nutrition and your training is good, you can keep your body fat relatively low. And um, even coming into college, I didn't drink much before I went to college. I played a lot of underage sports. Um, I was playing county teams, club teams, and football and GA was my life until the age of 18, until I went to college, 17 coming on 18. Um, so I was in already pretty good shape. I had a lot, of, a bit of muscle. I was in pretty decent shape because I had trained and I hadn't drank and I had my nutrition pretty good for a few years leading into that point. A lot of the GA youth program that I created is based off the program I needed at 16, 17 um, and cutting my own learning curve short. So for those of you that are coming through that now um, or for those of you who have children coming through that now, that was largely down to me trying to figure out how can I improve my sporting performance? How can I get more athletic? How can I get a six pack and how can I study better? Um, so my, my GA youth program is entirely based off of that now. But in terms of 
staying on track with alcohol, I went to college and got very, very heavy into the party scene. I still played sports, I still went to the gym, and I still ate right. And I spoke in the book, in the alcohol section, how your body can use alcohol as a fuel source. So if you've ever gone for a run, or ever gone to the gym, or ever worked out after a heavy night of drinking, it feels like you're sweating the alcohol out. That's because the bo- your body will use alcohol as a primary fuel source, and that's why it feels like you're sweating cider, or you're sweating beer, or you're sweating vodka. So your body is burning through it. So as long as you're in college, and you are drinking a few nights a week. Now I was drinking four, five, six nights a week, but I was eating really, really clean. I was eating a lot of vegetables. I was eating some fruits in the morning. I was eating a lot of lean protein. I wasn't eating that many carbs, um, and I was keeping my calories calories relatively low, so it kept me pretty lean. And I had a very high training intensity. So when I wasn't on the pitch training with you know the Sligo team or they the, any of the teams that I was playing with, even club. I was in the gym and my training intensity was high. I was doing a lot of circuits, I was doing a lot of finishers, I was doing a lot of high intensity work. So I was able to come out the other side. However, my immune system took an awful hit on that because when you're training, and training is a stressor, alcohol is a stressor to a degree, it's, it's a toxin to the body, so detoxing from it is gonna stress your body. So my immune system took a pretty big hit. So I was sick a lot. Um, I had a very bad stomach problem, I got a stomach ulcer, um, I was sick and got colds and flus all the time, so it's not something I recommend doing. However, for those of you that are going through college, understand that you can definitely stay in shape drinking a few nights a week, providing your nutrition is good and providing your training and that you're not eating crappy takeaway food and pizzas and these foods every night of the week because that's what's going to set you back. Your trans fatty acids, your fast foods, these are the things that are going to set you back long term in terms of staying in relatively good shape or staying relatively lean coming through college when you're drinking a few nights a week. So my advice would be is obviously there's a little hacks and I talk about them in the book about calories and using clear spirits and using light beers to keep your actual calorie intake down. But on top of that, just making sure you're eating loads of vegetables, a lot of broccoli, cauliflower, ones that are going to help detoxify your liver. Maybe get your hands on some milk thistle, which will help your liver detoxify itself naturally. Um, keep your training program good. Probably scale back your hardest training days around when you're hungover um, because that wasn't something I did. And as a result, I kept getting sick because my immune system was taking that hit. So they're kind of learned from my mistakes. I love the brand and mold quotes. Smart people learn from their mistakes. The really sharp ones learn from the mistakes of others. So by all means, go out, enjoy college. College is literally the best time. Like it was the best time of my life. My four-year undergraduate, I got an honors degree in business. Um, and before I went and did a postgraduate in teaching, that was the best four years of my life. I had an incredible time. I loved it. Um, probably too much so, but a lot of again, your mess becomes your message. And one of the reasons that I was able to come out and I'm probably so strict with my lifestyle now in terms of um from the outside world, in terms of strict, I'm not to me it's not strict, it's just the way I live. But the reason I don't drink as much anymore is because I did, I pulled that band back as far as it fucking go and I, I let loose with it. Um, so now I've came out the other side. It's something that I do recommend people doing. Even when Holly is 17, 18, I'll be recommending her going to college, even if just for the life experience of meeting new people, finding out who you are, enjoying the party scenes, you can get it out of your system so that you're not blackguarding and fucking around at 35, so that it's out of your system as a guy or as a girl, um, and you'll have friends that you'll have for life through that. So it's something that I advise nearly anybody do, just as the experience but in terms of getting in shape and staying in shape through college, that's effectively what I would do now if I could go back and change it. It's what I did and stayed in shape. I would just make sure that I wasn't training as hard and I was hungover. I'd probably have a little bit more complex carbs in there so I wasn't getting sick. Um, And I'd probably supplement back in some vitamin C and vitamin D so that my immune system wasn't taking a hit. And then I'd use the milk thistle to make sure my liver was detoxifying every day. Um, So I'd at least get my body back on track faster um, and then burn through that alcohol when I was training, just not as intensely as it was. Um, So hopefully that helps a lot. Okay, last question comes in from, uh, there's no name on this because she actually asked not to put her name. My boyfriend broke up with me. We were together since we were 18. How can I get over it? Um, Okay, so I'm not sure of your age now, but it sounds like you were together for quite a while. Um, So breakups are never easy um, and I'm definitely not the best person to ask on this but I can offer a lot from the psychology side and things to look out for and watch out for as someone that's came through bad breakups as somebody that's witnessed it with other friends and family 
One of the things you gotta be very, very careful of when you come out of a relationship, particularly a long-term one, is that you don't replace the time that you spent with your partner with something that's not going to support your lifestyle in general. And so a lot of people will land with this and a lot of people will have seen it with their friends. Like they say, and there's a joke in the fitness world that breakup makes bodybuilders. Um, and a lot of guys will turn to the gym because they're like, well, I'm going to get jacked now. Um, and I'm going to pull all the women and they'll come out and they'll use that. And that's a positive way to channel the energy in terms of making your life better. There's other guys and other girls that come out of relationships and end up drinking way more. Or worse, they end up turning to food and getting food just some form of unhealthy relationship with food because they end up replacing the time that they spent with their partner or their ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend with something that's not supporting their lifestyle or health in general. Um, it's effectively nearly a numbing mechanism. So when you understand a little bit more on the mindset psychology of dealing with loss, which is effectively the, 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 what happens in a relationship, you have a mild sense of loss. Again, we experience this massively when we have the death of a loved one, and we experience it minorly when we have a breakup with somebody because we're still dealing with that loss. And you end up trying to replace that and numb out from that. I've done it myself when I've came out of relationships and I've gone into the gym and I'd be training three, four, five hours a day because I was numbing out from not dealing with the emotions and the feelings that were coming up within me for the sense of loss from missing that person. Um, and that's just the way I channeled it, which isn't healthy either because nobody should be five hours in a gym. It's stressing your body way too much, um, but it was my way of dealing with it because I came out of my alcohol scene, I came out of that party lifestyle and it was the way I had turned with it. So it's gonna be a balance one of the things I would recommend anyone that's going through a breakup do is start filling that void in time with spending more time with your friends, spending more time with your family, and start engaging in some more healthier habits or hobbies that are going to support things that you want to do and the person you want to become. What happens sometimes in a relationship is, particularly when you've been with somebody since 16, 17, 18, it becomes so comfortable and you become so ingrained in that lifestyle and you're used to coming home to them after work or after school or after college and then when they're gone there's this void so it's filling that void with something that's going to support you some people do it with food some people do it with alcohol some people do it with excessive exercise it's just understanding that that's numbing out from the situation and you can do it in a healthier way what i would advise you do is start to think of the things that you couldn't do when you were going out with somebody sometimes you want to join a hobby you might want to join yoga or join some circuit classes or you may want to do a reading club whatever it is that you're interested in that you couldn't do when you were in a relationship start using that time now to fuel that version of that person you want to become also your friends and your network the people that you may not have been able to spend as much time with and and anyone that's listening to this will know that sometimes when your best friend your boy your best friend who's a boy or your best friend who's a girl gets into a relationship you don't see them for a year you don't see them for 18 months until they break up and then they're back in your life so it's on so making up that time now so that you can build on that relationship and so it doesn't happen again and you have a better balance next time and then after that it's going to be understanding that if you end up doing things to excess and you end up going out five or six nights a week and you end up hooking up with every guy or every girl or you end up in the gym for five hours or you end up drinking at home every night, that's numbing out from the situation. And when you can catch that, you can take ownership of it and when you take ownership of something, you can change it. So it's very important that if that's happening and you're falling into that trap, to just recognize it for what it is and pull yourself back out of it and realize that doing things that are going to support the version of the person that you want to be is what you need to do when you come out of a relationship. It's very, very difficult and I'm not going to say by any means that this is going to make it all better, but as somebody that's been through it and somebody that has seen it with some of my closest friends and family go through it, they're the takeaway points that I would have seen and they're the things that I would offer. So start replacing your time with the things that you enjoy, new hobbies, new friends, new outings, the things that you couldn't do and start seeing the glass as half full as opposed to half empty and this is an opportunity to grow and become a stronger version of you. Everything that doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Everything that where well, you're hurting and feeling horrible about the situation right now is going to have a stronger version of you out the other side. That's one of the reasons that I signed up for the Marathon Disables. That still scares the fucking shit out of me doing 256 kilometer run through the Sahara Desert. 
but I know that the person I'm going to become out the other side is going to be a stronger version of me because behind every fear is a person you want to be. All the things that scared me, all the discomfort, all the situations and the relationships and the things that made me question existence and Am I good enough for my self-worth? All of these things led to a stronger version of me out the other side. And this breakup will do the exact same thing for you if you let it. If you make the right decisions and you don't numb out from it and you start filling that void and filling that time with constructive things, you're going to come out a stronger version of you as a result. And the next relationship you're in is going to probably be even better because you're going to be a better version of the you who you are right now. Okay, so that's everything from today's episode. Massive thank you for listening. For more information on my GA Lean Body program and my Top 50 program or my new GA Youth program, head over to the website, www.briankeyfitness.com or send me an email. My Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram is all Brian Key Fitness. Snapchat, BrianK019. Massive thank you to Karma Voxano who puts together all my podcast episodes. Catch you all soon.